Let's take a look this morning at uh, Isaiah chapter 6. I'm going to be in the uh, English Standard Version this morning. Please follow along in your own Bible. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the threshold shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. At the sound, woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. Holiness is God's most noted attribute. It's not the one that's very popular in, in the United States culture and so forth, and we don't want to think about it too much, but in Scripture, he is called holy more than he's called anything else. And we talked about it, the girls knew. He's loving, he's kind, he's forgiving. Those are attributes of God, but holiness outranks them. It's the number one thing. It's mentioned uh, 637 times in Scripture. God is referred to as holy. In fact, in the book of Isaiah alone, 30 times, God is holy. The Hebrew word for uh, holy is kadosh. I don't know if I'm saying that right. But kadosh or be, it means to cut or more, more specific to cut off or to be separated from. There's a, there's a difference between that which is holy and everything else. It's other. Here we have the, a trihagion, or a three times holy, holy, holy. And in Hebrew culture and language, when you repeat something three times, it's for supreme emphasis. We might say someone is beautiful, but then we say they're beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. And the, and the idea is it's just, it's beyond anyone else. This uh, trihagion is very important in Isaiah because it helps us understand God's number one characteristic. So the teaching starts with a time frame, King Uzziah. The, you're the King Uzziah. Why is that important? Well, it gives us a date in history. Uh, king Uzziah was the king of Judah. They'd been king for 52 years, and they'd been 52 good years in which Uzziah was trying to follow God's law and Uzziah's people, the Tribe, the kingdom of Judah was blessed by their king's obedience. But even before Uzziah died, things were beginning to deteriorate and fall apart. And if you have any question about that, go back and read Isaiah 5. Isaiah is going to identify some things that are beginning to fall apart within the Hebrew culture of that time. Isaiah, for his entire ministry, maybe his entire life, he had King Uzziah on the throne. And sometimes we think when someone that we trust and is godly is on the throne, we're, we're going to be okay. Sometimes we think, well, if the President of the United States is a strong Christian, then, then we're going to be okay. Or if the King of England or is a strong, or whoever the leader might be in, uh, in politics and, and in rule, we think if, if they believe in God 
and they're following after God, then we're all going to be okay as their subjects. In the absence of anyone on the throne, Isaiah is there feeling that absence and saying, who is on the throne? And who does he see in Isaiah 6? He sees that God is on his throne. And that's a very important thing for Isaiah and for us to recognize that God is never off of his throne. And there's no circumstance that is going to come upon the earth and within our culture or anybody else's culture that God isn't able to take care of and work through. So what does holiness mean? I'm going to give you four things that it means. First one is holiness means transcendent. The, the otherness of God, the separation of God. God is not the man upstairs. He's not the big guy. That's rather offensive. God is other. God is holy. God is unique. God is only God. No one else comes close. This idea of, of holiness is something that that we need to recognize as believers that he is so separate from us that apart from his grace, we don't have a chance. The second thing that happens when Isaiah see God, sees God's holiness and hears the seraphim crying out, holy, 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 is that it magnifies depravity. Now I took that word from Calvin, but it's not a bad word. It's a pretty good word to describe the human condition as compared to a holy God. We are indeed depraved. It's not a bad word. Isaiah says, woe is me. And we think, well, wait a minute now. If Isaiah was, woe to Isaiah, what about the rest of us? Because Isaiah is a pretty exemplary dude, right? He's a pretty amazing guy. He, he could write a book, The Day I Saw God. It would be a bestseller. If there was TV back then, he'd be on the TV circuit. And yet Isaiah's response is, Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips. You see, when Isaiah sees God's holiness, he can't help but see his own unholiness. There's other examples in Scripture too. God refers to Job when he's talking with Lucifer, Satan, the enemy. He says, that Job is the finest there is. He's the apotheosis of, of righteousness. He, he's the, what, the, the man who's made it. And yet at the end of the book, when Job is able to see God, Job says, I've heard of you, but now I've seen you, and I abhor myself. In comparison to my love and worship of one who is holy, I'm I'm dust. I'm nothing. It's almost like, I'll give you another example. Uh, Peter, probably the best fisherman in Galilee. Uh, pretty self-confident, uh, able, strong, able to lead other people. Uh, very, very competent fisherman, but he has a night of absolutely no success whatsoever. Jesus shows up and says, well, let's go fishing. Here's what I fished all night, and this is what I've caught. Nothing. And so I, but you know what? You, uh, you asked, and so I'll take you. And so they go out into the Sea of Galilee, and Jesus says, all right, catch your net here. They catch so many fish, they can't even get them in the boat. And, and Peter's struggling with that net, and he realizes who he's with, or he begins to realize who he's with, and he falls on his face and says, Lord, depart from me, for I am a sinful man. Peter recognizes one who is other, one who is holy, one who is the Lord. It's like one of us saying, well, you know, I played baseball pretty good in high school. I even played a little bit in college. It's like one of us that think we have that pretty good, and then we go play around a, a game with Mike Trapp. We find out, yeah, we're, we're not in the same league at all. Or we think we're a good golfer, and then we play around with, with Tiger Woods. We're like, yeah, not quite so exemplary at that either. 
Or we take our crayon scrap, we take some Crayola crayons and we mark all over a piece of paper and we, we compare ourselves to Michelangelo and we're like, no, that's, that's too far off. Those comparisons break down. <laughs> I got this one from uh, uh, Max Ocato. He says, you don't impress the officials at NASA with your paper airplane. In other words, the comparison of ourselves to God is so far apart that his holiness magnifies just how sinful we truly are. In other words, show me a prideful person, I'll show you someone who has not met God. Let's take a look at illustration one. And so here's, here's man over here on this side of the chasm. So, Rossi, this was you. And you were going to jump to where God is. But the, what's in the way is our own sin. Now, what's really crazy is that you can't see him because they're too tiny. There's all kinds of people up here who are playing the holier-than-thou game. And they're thinking, okay, well, this person's pretty good, so I'm not going to think about them too much. But I can look down on the persons over here because I'm so much holier than thou. I'm so much holier that I, 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 don't, I think I'm going to be okay. Because God, God sees me. The, the publican prayed this in the temple. He said, thank God, God, I thank you that I'm not like that sinner over there. That's not even a prayer. That's, that's just bragging is what that ultimately is. And here's what happens as people try to move towards uh, holiness and righteousness. As they get closer and closer to this, this whole game of holier than thou gets sillier and sillier to the point that you get here and it's terrifying. And the idea of wanting to be holier than you were at here, there's no way. That gulf is too big. That holiness is too holy, holy, holy for us to make that jump. Seeing God changed Isaiah. And seeing God will change you and change me in our own self-awareness. It's not that it's going to put down our self-worth and our self-esteem. Don't think that's not what I'm saying. I'm, I'm not saying that seeing God for his holiness is going to make you think, all right, well, I'm just a worm. I'm, I'm. The reality is that God reveals to you that you are made in his image and it actually lifts you up in your self-esteem. But you recognize that he is so far, he is so transcendent. If it weren't for Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit and the fact that God is also eminent and personal and involved in your life and loves you just the way you are, we wouldn't stand a chance. Isaiah says, Woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips, and I've dwelt among a people of unclean lips. Do you and I dwell among a people of unclean lips? Yup. If ever I had a doubt of that, if ever you have a doubt of that, come ride with me as I show for a bunch of people who are trying to have fun in their own strength and with their own agenda. And you'll hear music and you'll hear a conversation that is unclean. I'm, I, I want to be careful when I get into this because there's some things that, that should be cringy, but please don't think, please don't think that after this list, if God convicts you that he's trying to convict you, don't do this around Jeremy because he'll be offended. Because that's not the issue. I, I work with some pretty depraved people. And none of you are in danger of offending me. But there's some things on this list that I think we sometimes gloss over and don't think about as part of our sinful nature. You ever heard someone say, when I see God, I got some things I want to tell him. That's kind of cringy. Because when you see God, you're going to fall flat on your face. As a man who is dead, unless he allows you to continue to live. You hear someone pray, and Lord, if I've sinned, please, if I've sinned, 
We live in a state of sin. David Ramsey heard his family and heard his grandmother, I think it was his grandmother, I'm not getting the story wrong, it might have been aunt, but I think it was his grandmother, who, who always said, I just hope that I've been good enough to get into God's heaven. And all the people in David Ramsey's family say, oh, grandma, you're, you're good, you're, uh, God loves you. But they were taking David Ramsey to church every Sunday, and he was actually listening to what God's word says. And so one day he got old enough and brave enough to go ahead and say, well, you're not good enough, but by God's grace, Jesus loves you. And his sacrifice means you get to be in heaven forever. That's what he meant to say. But all he got out was, well, you're not good enough, but, and the family went wild. David said, Grandma's going to hell. And that's not what David was saying at all. We need to be careful about the things that we say. We're not righteous. And sometimes we, we look around and we think we need to be given a break. We think we need to, well, God will give me a pass because he knows I'm trying. And the truth is that God's grace is the only thing that's going to reach us from our jumping point to his presence and to his love. I cringe a little bit when I hear someone say, OMG, or oh my God, because they're not thinking about God at all. It, uh, and please don't, if, if, if that's you and God puts you under conviction, don't do it because I'm around. If God brings you to conviction on that, I mean, I remember my mom, as when I was a little boy, saying, now, Jeremy, we don't say golly, and we don't say gosh, because that's pretty close to using the Lord's name in vain. We don't want to get as close as we can. We want to get as far away as we can. I remember as a little boy learning that, learning the respect for a holy God, a God who is other. I like the story of Frederick the Great. He was visiting a Berlin prison. And as he walked through the prison, he had one prisoner after another calling out, Oh, King, Your Highness, I'm not supposed to be here. I'm innocent. I, I should, this is not the right punishment. I'm falsely accused. He heard it over and over and over again. His prisoners called out and said, Get me out of here, O King. I, I don't belong here. This is the wrong... I, I'm, I'm innocent. I haven't done anything. As he continued his tour, he met, uh, he encountered someone in their cell who was sitting there with his head bowed, not even looking up. And Frederick the Great says, I suppose you're going to tell me you don't belong here either. He says, no, King, I'm, I'm guilty. In fact, I deserve the punishment that the law provides for, for me. I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be. So Frederick the Great told the people with him that run the prison, release that man. And then he uses some sarcasm. I, I like sarcasm. I, I think it's fun. That's why I like the story. And they said, but he's guilty. He said, I understand that. He said, but we can't have a rascal like that changing and polluting and and all these innocent people. <laughs> in other words, he knew better that all those other people in prison were not innocent. But he wanted to extend forgiveness and use sarcasm to make that point. We all are in a state of sin. And whatever game you play over on that side of who you think you're better than and who you think is worse than you is a very dangerous game. Third point. Holiness not only means transcended, not only does it um, does it uh, magnify our depravity, I'm sorry, but it also mandates our purification. Verse 6, Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. 
Ouch. I've been around hot coals. I've, I've cooked over hot coals. And the idea of the most sensitive part of your body in touching a live hot coal, that's a, that's a pretty painful picture. And yet, why is that the picture of purification for Isaiah? Because Isaiah has just told God, I'm a man of unclean lips. And one there in the worship of God's throne room says, we'll meet, we'll meet you there at your, at your point of sin and we'll purify you. This next picture kind of shows what happens in purification. The idea of Isaiah having his lips touched with a live coal is predating and looking forward to what the cross of Christ does. But the only way we get from our side of that chasm of sin over to this side of righteousness and experiencing holiness is by the Holy One, Jesus himself, who by his cross provided us a way to experience God's holiness. So Isaiah's looking forward to it with a hot coal. We're looking back at it with thankfulness and grateful hearts. And yet that's the only way that God has ever provided a chance for those of us who are unholy to get to experience his holiness. It mandates our purification. A holy God has made a way for unholy people. That's the message of the Bible. That's, that's the gospel. A good summation of the gospel is found in 1 Peter 3, the first part of verse 18. For Christ suffered once for sins, the righteousness for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. Back to that picture. Jesus brings us to God because he died righteous. And our unrighteousness is atoned for. Then we get to the fourth point of holiness. This is for the first time in this entire story, God speaks. And it's there in verse 8. And God said, and, and then I hear a voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? We could unpack the Trinity of that verse. And I said, Here am I. Send me. Isaiah is not coerced. He's cleansed by that coal. God's holiness motivates a response from us. We should respond to God's holiness when we realize that he cleanses us so that we might partake and participate in his holiness. Once you're cleansed, you want to be commissioned. You want to be called. God in his holiness convicts you. God in his love cleanses you. God in his wisdom calls you. And God in his power qualifies you. In other words, his holiness leads to our wholeness. You want to be whole? You want to be healed? You want to be restored? His holiness is the gateway to your wholeness. God's holiness is not contained within himself. It's too, God is so holy that it emanates from him. He never runs out of holiness. It's not like he has a, a set amount. It's an infinite holiness. And because of that, he is able to claim other, not only people, but things. In the Old Testament, in Leviticus, they talk about things that are used in worship. And he says, desecrate, not desecrate, but... Um, Pray for these things and, and I will make them holy in worship. Some utensils and some other things that are used in, in temple worship, even the robe that the priest wore. God says, consecrate them to me and I will make them holy for you. God's holiness is so big and so great that there's enough of it for all of us. That's a good thing. Leviticus 11, quoted by Peter in the New Testament, says, You must be holy because I am holy. 
That does not mean that we look at God's holiness and we work harder. <laughs> that is not the picture here. The idea is that as we grow closer to God, His holiness will involve, involve our sanctification, will change our hearts, will change our attitudes towards one another, to our attitudes towards people who we encounter. In other words, God's holiness has enough to go around for each of us. We need a God who is holy. And not just holy, but holy, holy, holy. We need uh, any, anything less is not sufficient. Hebrews 12, 14 says, Strive for peace with everyone and strive for holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Church family, our relationship with God will always be transformative. It's not that it was transformative years ago when we share our testimony. It's transformative today, and it's going to be transformative tomorrow. We are ever changed by an unchanging God. Our relationship is transformative. How? Well, I think of the of Milo Lefebvre. He died last year, I think, or year before. And his wonderful rock song, Love God and Hate Sin. And man, in my younger years, I would really rock out to that song, Love God, Hate Sin. But the, rea the reality is that God loves righteousness and he hates sin. And if we will align ourselves with him and then get in relationship with him, guess what's going to happen in our lives? We're going to love righteousness more and more and we're going to hate sin more and more because we are changed by his holiness. It's transformative. You won't be perfect. Wow, my father pretty sensitive. You won't be perfect until he's finished with your sanctification. But we can be purposeful. Purposefully set ourselves this day to grow in our relationship to his holiness. Anybody think of another trihagion where God is called holy, holy, holy? You know, it's the only attribute of God that is repeated three times in Scripture. This is it. This is it. Holy is, is, is pretty crucial to our understanding of who God is. The other trihagion is in, in Revelation chapter 4. And so I want to read that for you, and then I want to share with you a thought. Verse 1, after this, uh, Revelation 4, After this I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and ruby, a rainbow that shone like an emerald and circled the throne. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, and seated on them were 24 elders, and they were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. We'll jump down to verse 6. Also in front of the throne there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. And in the center around the throne were four living creatures, and they had covered with, with eyes in front and in back. Jump on down to verse 8. Each of the four living creatures had six wings, sound familiar, and was covered with eyes all around, even under its wings. Day and night they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. Think about what Isaiah wrote Isaiah. And then John has his vision of Revelation. That's a long time. That's 750 years. The song hasn't changed in God's throne room. For 750 years, the song has been holy, holy, holy. And nobody in that worship experience is thinking, you know, we've kind of done this. 
we, we kind of we, we, we've kind of overdone this. We've talked about God's holiness now for 750 years. Can't we do a new song or some new lyrics? No one is tired in the presence of God of recognizing that one is holy and transcendent and then thanking him for his evidence and for his Holy Spirit who comes to us in our point of need and says, he is holy. We want, I want you to become holy because he is holy. I hope this passage rings true for you as a representative of what worship is supposed to be. I saw a friend a few years ago by, by Chris Tomlin. Uh, I think I've sung it before for you. Um, I'm going to try to lead you in this. We've got the lyrics for this. But the idea of this song is that he's holy forever. There's, there's never going to be enough experience to completely contain the awe that we should have in a holy God. So let's sing this together. If it's new to you, I, I understand. And also, it's kind of high, so if you want to bring it down a little bit and sing it a little bit, that's fine. But uh, I, I'm going to lead us in Holy Forever. It's a worship song you may hear on the radio if you listen to Christian radio. <laughs> 